All right. I think we will uh, start. Still a few people joining today, which is good, but I think we'll kick off. We've got plenty to get through this morning. Um, heaps of insights and uh, a new face as well that's joining us. And I will uh, do some proper introductions in just a second. So thank you to everyone for joining us today. Credit Watch Business Risk Index. It's actually been a few months since I've, I've done it. It's been looked after well by James O'Donnell, um, MD, at Open Analytics, James. Thank you for um, for looking after our um, our attendees and our webinars for the last couple of months with with our uh, digital content manager Michael Pollack. Great to have you back. So looking forward to getting Thank into you very it. Much. Thanks, Patrick. It was a pleasure. And um, we're we're very lucky to have Creditor Watch's new chief economist join us as well in Annika Thompson. So Annika, thanks for joining us, and she's joining from beautiful beautiful Murray region, supporting regional Australia, regional tourism. Um, <laughs> so thanks for joining us, and I think it pops up. James was saying in one of our uh, in one of our regional assessments, a, a low risk region to be in. So Annika, great to have you on board, um, and and looking forward to getting your insights as well. Um, for, for everyone listening in, Annika is our new uh, Chief Economist for Creditor Watch. She's a Founder and Managing Director of Clio Research and has been providing research and consulting services to both domestic and offshore clients for more than 50 years. Um, she's got a great background in, in real estate agency research, but also economics and finance and has formulated industry leading data for, for many, many years. And she's really going to complement um, Creditor Watch, complement James and complement our data importantly. Um, her experience of being at the first step of data creation process gives her a unique perspective when it comes to analysing data and providing economic forecasts. She's been really looking forward to getting into to Credit Watch's data. I only joined a few weeks ago um, and has already got some fantastic insights with us. She's built really fantastic relationships um, with market experts and works collabor collaboratively with them um, when she's modelling her research. So she'll give us a, a really um, healthy and holistic view of the Australian economy. So Annika, thanks for joining us. Pleasure, happy to be here. So we'll jump into really quick intro. As always, everyone, please do ask questions. Um, if there's any really, really relevant, urgent ones, um, I'll interrupt um, either Annika or James, um, but I typically don't like to interrupt them mid-flow and, and knock them off, uh, off, their, off their keel. So if we, uh, if we don't get to them during, we'll get to them after. So don't be, uh, don't be shy to ask questions along the way. As always, a little bit about Creditor Watch. We are Australia's uh, leading commercial credit reporting bureau with well over 55,000 companies using us across Australia from small businesses all the way up to some of the largest ASIC listed companies in Australia across all industries and pretty much every region is covered as well. So we're providing that 360 degree view of credit risk, but also providing the software and the tools to power your credit risk management function, regardless of the size or type of business that you are in. A huge amount of data comes into our bureau every single day. And I've got a really, really hot, exciting one to talk about later on, which is ATO tax defaults that just went live yesterday with Creditor Watch only. Um, so I'll have to get that smack bang in the middle of, uh, of this um, graphic that you're looking at. So huge amount of data coming in from public, private, government um, and, and government, I should say, data sources, um, ASIC Australian Business Register, APSA, but also from our customer base in the form of payment defaults, which we've seen an increase in, um, receivables data, which is really powerful to understand how businesses pay their bills and is uh, very often a leading indicator of delinquency when they start to have uh, blowouts in their invoice repayment times. Um, so what we're going to do is pretty much jump straight into uh, Annika's presentation. She's got a few slides to take us through and um, you will hear from me later on. But for now, over to the experts. Annika, thanks very much. All yours. Hi everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Um, and apologies if I'm right on the Murray River. So if you hear a boat going past, um, people having some school holidays fun. Um, so probably on the, on the flip side of fun, um, we've, we start with inflation and it's what everyone in the economic world just in Australia and globally is talking about right now. Um, we don't know where we're at in Australia right now, but I think um, if we're thinking about what's gonna happen to the credit market going forward, 
it's good to get some insights as to what might be coming our way in Australia. Um, so I thought I'd give you some context with this chart about what's happening overseas. So I've chosen the United Kingdom, the United States, and the OECD average, um, just to give some context. And you can see from that chart that it is far worse overseas. And obviously um, in Europe, they're far more um, impacted by what's happening in Ukraine and Russia. They source a lot of their goods from there. Um, and this morning, the US's um, latest inflation figure came out. So um, that is eight and a half percent, that gray line going up outside the chart there, which is um, pretty concerning. Most of it's driven by fuel costs um, and labor costs. Um, other goods were actually okay. So they think inflation might be peaking in the US, but um, certainly haven't seen the peak yet. So overseas, is, they've already started switching their monetary policy settings um, to rein inflation in. It's really important that you don't let that um, cost spiral keep going. Um, sorry, Janice, can we just go back? One oh, second? sorry. Um, so I guess what the, the, the takeout here for Australia is it's unlikely to have peaked here. Um, the NAB Business Confidence Survey came out yesterday. You might have, um, some of you might have looked into it. It was very um, good results, I guess, for, for a confidence perspective. Um, but what was in there is that purchasing costs have increased, um, labour costs have increased, and prices have increased by the highest level since they've ever done that survey. So it is coming. Um, we've got all the signs that 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 dark blue line there is going to increase. Um, and one of the issues is we've got labour shortages, shortages in this country and we really haven't um, got a solution to them yet other than um, increasing migration, but that takes a long time to, to work through the economy. Um, so going forward, um, I guess what inflation will do, the obvious one is that the cash rate will rise and we, we you know, it's almost 100% guaranteed to rise in the next um, couple of months. Um, but consumer confidence is one I think we should all keep an eye on. So James, if we can move forward to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and again, I've looked at consumer confidence overseas to give us an, an idea of what might be happening. Um, it's almost a mirror image to what happens in inflation um, in other countries. And I've given some long time series data. Um, I'm very big on, on long sets of data so you can see what's happened in history. So it, it helps us understand if it's good or bad today. Um, but you see in Australia, consumer confidence is actually okay compared to other countries, but we're, we're much earlier in our inflation cycle. So I would expect consumer confidence to continue to decline as people start getting um, a bit of a shock about prices that they see. That they see. Um, and you see that third po dot point there, I've used the term unprecedented, which we probably all hate after two years of reading it in the media every single day. Um, but I think it's worth saying that there are a lot of wage earners, particularly young adults, millennials, people in their 20s, um, who would never have experienced inflation before. So they're used to prices going down, they're used to globalization, cheaper fashion coming in the country. They're very, um, it'll be quite a shock to them to see prices going up on consumer goods. And I think that will have an outside impact, an outsized impact on consumer confidence going forward. Um, and just the three sort of leading indicators um, to finish off with, we can go forward again, please, Jane, um, that I really think we should keep an eye on. Inflation, obviously, um, we just talked about, um, but I guess it, it's, it's, we all know the prices are going up. What its impact on um, real income growth will be is, is probably the key thing. If wages, if inflation is going up and wages are keeping pace, it's not so bad if wages aren't keeping pace. Um, that's where we get issues in the economy. And we've already seen um, in that NAB survey that came out that it, labor costs were going up, but, but other costs were going up more. So at this stage, it, it seems like real incomes are going backwards. Um, and as James will talk about, we've already seen um, an increased risk in the food and beverage sector and the arts and entertainment sector. So these are areas where people have a choice. You know, if prices are getting too high, I won't go out for dinner. I won't go and see that show. Um, so we're already seeing some increased risk in those discretionary spending areas. Um, obviously, monetary policy, a big one to watch. Um, most economists expect that June will be the month once we get a few more data points in and the, and the RBA is quite um, certain of where inflation is going and, and how thick it is. Um, how big that, that, that monetary policy um, adjustment will be is a bit of a guessing game at the moment again if consumer if wages if 
price increases and cash rate increases have a sort of a big psychological effect on people. We might not need as many cash rate increases um, as sort of textbook economics would suggest, but we've just got to see how people react to these price increases and it'll take a few months to work through. Um, and finally, wages growth. So um, the budget papers um, assumed a level of wages growth, um, assumed that some of it is happening now by people changing jobs or um, getting bonuses and things like that. Um, a really important thing to keep an eye on is the Fair Work Commission's um, national minimum, minimum wage order. Um, so that will be announced sometime around mid-June um, and it, it hits people's pay packets on the 1st of July. So that covers everyone um, on an award wage um, and submissions are currently going in. So we've got submissions as high as 5% down to as low as nothing. Um, and that will give us a real indication of how sticky inflation is and where real income growth will be and what might happen for consumer confidence going forward. So keep an eye on those three. Um, so that's it for me. I think um, as what, what you'll see from James is that a lot of these um, cost pressures are feeding into um, some of the riskier um, sectors that he'll talk through now. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Annika. So yes, yeah, so I will touch on some of the, those themes that, that Annika's mentioned there, particularly around inflation and some of the, the industries that are affected. So switching pace a bit into, I guess, more of the, the granular creditor watch data. So the insights for this month from the, the business risk index. So the high level things we're seeing, there's actually some good news. So for now two months in a row, we've seen both business B2B trade activity and credit inquiries increase. So we were somewhat sort of cautiously optimistic uh, this time last month, but we've now seen sort of two months in a row where we've seen business turnover go up and also credit inquiries. And that's in the context of both of those statistics trending down for the last two years or so. So that's one good thing. On the flip side, um, we're seeing some impairments come through in default. So Again, similar sort of trends over the last two months, we're seeing trade payment defaults and court actions also increase. So I'll show you some, some nice charts that show that behaviour. Um, third point, probably the, probably the most interesting one for this month, is actually seen quite a bit of movement amongst industries. So number one, we've seen hospitality or food and beverages um, in, industries have now, they're, they're typically the highest risk industry, but the gap has opened up on, on the rest of the field. And then arts and recreation and transport have actually jumped quite a few spots and are now the second and third highest risk for ind industries by default risk. Um, and then finally, some of the key points at the regional level, we've got a, got a new lowest risk region, so that the wheat belt in WA, which, is always, which has been faring well for the last couple of years, but sort of jumped up to the, the top of our business risk index. And then at the other end of the scale, um, still a story of Western Sydney really sort of bringing up the, the rear. So Brinjelly, Green Valley, um, which is a smaller region in terms of numbers, but Maryland's Guildford is quite a large region with, you know, right down at the bottom of, of the index, which means high insolvency risk for that region. Okay, so just some, some pretty pictures to show some of that data. So start with the trade receivables, probably our, our favourite graph. So you can see the last three quarters on the right, so last three months on the right there. So we had the kind of lowest month on record, the really sort of depressing B2B trade activity on um, in January following essentially Omicron impacts. So when we're, we're measuring here the average trade receivables per data supplier to, to Credit Watch. So this is basically a measure of the, the volume of trade activity between businesses. So we've now seen sort of two months in a row of things going in the, the right direction. Um, then if you look at sort of year on year growth is, is a nice way to look at the data as well. So you can see there we really bottomed out in, in January, but it really looks quite clear that we've hit a bit of a turning point in terms of um, you know, B2B trade activity. Um, and similarly for credit inquiries, another small tick up, but the trend over the last two months, we're seeing more businesses seeking credit and that's generally a good sign of, of a bit more sort of business activity and business confidence. Okay, so then on the, on the performance in terms of defaults and, and arrears, so trade payments defaults we're looking at here. So um, these are B2B trade payments defaults that businesses are lodging with Creditor Watch. So they've, they've ticked up a bit over the last couple of months in line with things like insolvencies as well. Probably, uh, probably a little bit more stark is the court actions, which have been rising pretty steadily 
for a few months now. Um, so really with court actions, as with a lot of these sorts of adverse stats, they all you know, were quite depressed during COVID due to you know, the abnormal conditions, creditors not collecting, you know, ATO putting a pause on uh, enforcing tax arrears. Court actions is probably the, the, the leading indicator here that we're seeing that it's really returned to what it was um, pre-COVID. So the numbers we're seeing March 22, actually a little bit above what they were back in March 2020. So court actions are basically back up to where they were pre-COVID. And generally that's a pretty good leading indicator of you know, business failures and in, in, insolvencies down the track. And then finally, we yeah, the way Credit Watch boils that down into our probability of defaults using credit ratings. Of course, we're credit rating every business in the country. So the stats on these are ASIC registered um, small businesses. So aggregate level, what's the average default risk? You can see that sort of trend down um, over COVID it has now, if you look at the actuals on the left there, it's, it, it has started to rise. Um, and then we're, we're continuing to report about a 1% increase over the next 12 months or so. Um, I would say yeah, the way we derive these estimates, they're coming out of all of the you know, granular data from Credit, Credit Watch and rating systems or statistical models. Um, I'd say there's some downside risk here in terms of you know, some of the things that Annika talked about do take some time to flow through into transactional data and, and other things. So with if we're expecting inflation to to, um, to rise, then there's every chance that, that you know that these numbers could actually be even even worse than we're forecasting. Okay, so that's the I guess the key sort of call outs um, in terms of industries. I'll just reinforce some of those comments I made before. Ranking of industries by probability of default. Now we've been re reporting since we started the business risk index presentations that food and beverage is the, the highest risk. Uh, it's the nature of that industry, quite competitive, thin margins. Um, nothing has changed there except the, the gap between food and beverages and the other industries has opened up quite a bit. So we, we are certainly you know, seeing some of the effects of that you know, inflation, basically you know, industries that are supported by discretionary spending. Um, when people are tightening their belts, they're, they're the first hit. And yeah, anyone who's sort of <laughs> worked in the the, the um, hospitality industry knows that the yeah, running a business in those those industries is quite tough. Um, probably the, the biggest movers up the ranks actually the, the second and third, so art and recreation and transport. Again, arts and recreation is a, a group in that category very much affected by you know reduction in, in discretionary spending fueled by inflation. And then transport's probably the most obvious one in the world of petrol prices um, going up. So that obviously affects those industries. Um, then on, on our look at late payments and arrears. So again, we track the, the proportion of businesses that have 60 day late um, B2B arrears. Again, construction is consistently at the top there. So it's sort of calling out that one, but there you can see that in second place there is again the accommodation, food and beverages, so hospitality, and then sort of transport up there again in third. So I think very much we are actually seeing the the, the effects um, flow through the data, but I, I'd I'd say we're we're going to be watching those those discretionary spending industries along with construction pretty carefully over the next next six months or so. And, and James, just to jump in on, on that, it, it feels like, uh, throwing my memory back to last month, it, the gap has closed between, you know, construction and, and, you know, the next sort of five or six industries there, that there was, there was a, a bigger gap. So it seems like payment times have, have sort of, I won't say blown out, but have increased almost yeah. across the board. But yeah, but that, that's, that's true. Also and we've not... got more data coming through as well with, with an increase in, uh, in receivables as well. Yeah, so uh, I'd say yes, that's true, but it, it's more a case of um, it's not a case of construction deteriorating, although we are watching that industry quite closely. Um, it is a case of the others sort of jumping up a bit, as you mentioned. Um, I, I just I feel like I've been talking a little bit too gloomy, so I, I will mention some of the good ones at the other end of the scale that um, you know, as we've been reporting quite a bit, agribusiness is still going quite strong and, and healthcare. Manufacturing is some of the kind of highlights at the other end of the scale that are you know, good payers and also low insolvency risk at the moment. Um, 
I'll, I'll touch quickly on regional analysis because I don't want to take too much time away from Pat's announcement around the, the, the new ATO tax reporting data, but high level, yeah, it's a bit of fun. We like to, to show what are the, you know, by, by um, credit rating, what are the highest and lowest risk regions in the country. Recap, the business risk index is a ranking. So we, we basically order regions, about 300 regions by best to worst in terms of future insolvency risk. So the wheat belt has been quite low risk for a long time now, but it's sort of jumped up a bit to the, the top of the list. Then sort of down at the other end, um, Brinjelli, Green Valley, um, Maryland, Guildford, um, still high risk. And that sort of bottom 10 is still dominated by Western Sydney and the tourism industry affected areas around the Gold Coast and Surfers Paradise and, and in Queensland. Um, it's always good to look at the capital cities. So again, it's the, the same sort of story with the Eastern Seaboard. If you look at the index there, sort of on the far right, sort of in the 20s, that means they're sort of getting down to that bottom fifth um, of the of the scale. So they're quite quite high risk still in the in the CBDs. Um, and I should reiterate that these this metric is really targeted at, at that kind of small to medium size. So you know, shops, retail, trade, cafes are still really struggling in the in the CBDs on the on the eastern seaboard, whilst the kind of the likes of Perth and, and South Australia in Adelaide are, are still doing quite well. Um, I'm actually going to skip a few slides just to get to probably just a, a, a quick update on the um, on the flood impacted regions. So just looking at Richmond Valley, which is a, the the region that um, contains Lismore, still kind of in terms of average insolvency rate. So the red line there is the regions, the average default rates are still below the national average. So before the floods, it was actually uh, on the lower risk end of the scale for businesses. Um, if anything, we think the default data might get a bit distorted with um, banks stepping in with payment holidays. So we're keeping a close watch on that. The one thing we have seen, probably not, not something to get too alarmed about, but we have seen that B2B trade payment defaults in those flood affected regions have ticked up a little. Although again, they're actually coming from a low base, actually quite good payers in those regions before. Um, so we're seeing a bit of a uptick in B2B trade payment defaults in the, some of those flood affected areas that we're, we're keeping a watch on. Which is, which is sort of the opposite of what we've seen through COVID, but even going back to sort of Brisbane floods as well, where, where defaults generally reduce. Um, certainly seen that over, over the COVID period. Um, so that'll be, yeah. that'll be an interesting one to, to watch, but I, I dare say, like you say, it's off the back of that, that very low base as well. Yeah, very true. So um, to finish, I might sort of hand over to Pat to sort of make the announcement on, on some new data. Maybe, that, that... maybe jump back, back one slide, because I'm going to, I'll answer a couple of the questions that have come through and I'll, I'll save that for, yeah. for, for okay, the very yeah. end. And Annika, I wanted, wanted to sort of get your, um, your input here from a, are you um, bullish or bearish about, you know, the next sort of, you know, six to 12 months, we were sort of having a chat before we kicked off and, and inflation, um, you know, it, it obviously hurts everyone um, spend and, and, and the money in their, in their, in their account and, and what, they're, what they're sort of outlaying on a, on a daily or weekly basis. But really that, that interest rate rise is the sort of thing that everyone sees a lot more aggressively. Though not everyone has a uh, has a property, of course. What's your sort of you know outlook for for the next six to twelve months from a from a confidence and a positive or negative you know economic um, environment? Yeah. Um, so I guess James's chart on the on the um, the sliding scale of sectors is a really important one. I, I obviously inflation is the negative, but there were some positives that he pointed out. Um, manufacturing seems to be um, is probably a will be a growth sector in Australia because of basically, you know, we've, we've probably hit peak globalisation. Um, now, because of supply chain issues, cost of fuel, transport, it's actually going to be cheaper um, in the long run to make things here. So the manufacturing sector might, um, unusually, um, might be one of those sectors that actually is, is um, helps our Australian economy along. Obviously, agriculture, it's almost recession proof. We all need to eat. Um, and obviously there's issues with flooding in some parts and then it's dry in other parts of Australia, but that's, that's unfortunately nothing new to Australia. But those sectors and obviously health, um, health and aged care are um, almost um, inflation credit, you know, um, cash rate proof. Um, but again, anything that's, that's um, 
related to, to discretionary spending is um, really those sectors that I'm a bit concerned about. I was um, reading an interesting article last night um, and it will sound a bit uh, flippant, but about fish and chip shops in the UK. Um, yeah. But it's really interesting because their fish and chip shops are seen as an essential, basically, in the UK, cheap, everyone can afford it from, you know, the wealthiest person down to, to, um, to um, the, you know, low socioeconomic income earners. Um, and a lot of them are now going out of business because all their inputs from fish, potatoes, oil, fuel, energy, everything is going up. So. I do actually have a fish and ship association in the UK, believe it or not, and they estimate about a third of those businesses actually won't survive. And given everything the UK has gone through, world wars, um, you know, fuel crisis in the 70s, it's the first time they've ever really been impacted by, by sort of economic pressures. So I found that really interesting that we'll, we might see pressures on industries that we've never seen pressures on before. Um, and obviously, as I said, the UK is more, um, prone to these sorts of issues in Australia because we do um, manufacture a lot of our own food here, which is a good thing. Um, but it is certainly an interesting time we're going through um, and we haven't had a really strong inflationary environment for a really long time. Um, there's a lot of economists say that, that a lot of people have a lot of money in their bank and they're well ahead on their mortgage repayments after you know the last few years. Um, but it's it's more the behavioural economic side. So how how will all these pressures sort of impact people's thinking around their, their purchasing rather than do they actually have the cash in the bank to spend? So yeah, it's certainly a bumpy ride, and it's it's not something we've experienced in Australia for a long time. But I do personally think the RBA will be cautious in their cash rate approach, um, even after the election. Yeah, well, you know, they're, they're supposed to not worry about elections, their intent, but um, I think the last thing they'll want to do is impact that full employment measure. So the RBA has two two sort of jobs to do. It's to keep inflation in 2 to 3% and to also keep up that full employment. So um, they're equally as focused on both of them. Um, they won't want to bring inflation into the 2 to 3% band that blow out employment at the same time because... Um, they've put too many businesses under. So it's a really fine line that they'll be, they'll be trying to keep. Um, and I, I personally don't try to the full thought that we're going to cash rate up to 2.5% or time soon. I think it's going to be very measured increases. Um, and they'll do an increase, stop, maybe see how it's impacting the economy, maybe another one, stop, and, and check the data again. Yeah, great. That's good to hear as a... Uh... It's a homeowner myself <laughs> because it's Putting certainly a question I'm asking of, uh, of of anyone to try to get either free economic or uh, financial advice. So so thank you for that. <laughs> I think the, the the question of the the election as well. I mean, you know, we've been in this. We talk about phantom lockdowns through the start of the year. We've been in phantom campaign mode for for probably six weeks as well. So it's good to finally have that announced. But we know that that slows down parts of the economy and, and investment as well. Um, but it but it feels to me, you know, we I speak to a lot of um, you know either business owners or CEOs or um, you know people in credit and finance, and there's just a, there is certainly an appetite to get on with it, regardless of the pressures out there. You know, I think there's a genuine feeling that you know we we Australia's done extremely well, and we have through through the through the last two years of lockdowns, um, and you know if, if we can get through that, we can get through you know inflationary pressures. Uh, supply chain issues and then of course interest rate rises as well so um, that that's a positive there's a lot more certainty for businesses to to, to be able to invest and 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 get get going again and, and grow the business and hire people and and, and buy stock and, and invest in technology too so so that's really positive so at least you know that that'll keep the uh, the, the economy turning um, I've got a couple of questions here that have come through so it seems that more companies are being wound up in the last month or going into administration, is this a start of things to come? Certainly is. You know, our, our expectation was that we would probably see um, a return to pre-COVID numbers, um, you know, in the second half of this year from an insolvency pers perspective. And if you think about um, a debtor's journey to administration, it, it's generally, you know, payment default and, and court actions together, and then, you know, uh, an increase in um, 
in payment times, which we've, we've seen start to happen. And, and again, to Annika's point and to James' point, you've got to look at it industry by industry. It's, it's easy to, to sort of lump everyone in and generalise. Um, but if you, you, you see that with, a, with a, a debtor's journey to administration and then obviously insolvencies that or wind up and then insolvencies that, that final sort of point. So um, I think we're still, we're still sticking to that, James. Would that, would that be correct? Yeah, good answer. I would just answer that question as yes. <laughs> so yeah, very <laughs> much. I think um, yeah, the trigger is definitely being pulled by the you know, a lot of creditors are now just getting back to normal collections. And the one thing that I think sometimes confuses people that actually the the default rates are, are going to go up, but it's not necessarily the worst thing in the world. So that I, I yeah, you know, Patrick's mentioned this many times before. That it's effectively a return to normal. So. You, you actually need the pressure of insolvency for economies to work. So, um, yeah, we, we, if you if you recall our forecast, we're sort of expecting it to go a little bit above what it was before COVID. So we're not expect, you know, we're not predicting any wild swings in insolvencies or anything like that. So it's it's more like a return to to normal business activity than a big yeah. shock to the, the system. Yeah, we're still we're still well down, even even with an increase. You know, we probably need five or six months of, of consistent increases to get close to, you know, I think yeah. we're still down to the 30, 40% on pre-COVID numbers from an insolvency perspective. So yeah, that, that's certainly the start of things to come. Um, the, one other comment here, an increase in credit inquiries. Um, James mentioned obviously that, that that's a, you know, a sign of, uh, of the economy getting back into a normal gear, which, which I agree, I, I often call it the heartbeat of, you know, economic trade. Um, but a, a credit manager, experienced credit manager that I know has made the comment that also, you know, beware that it could be a sign that people are shopping around wanting multiple suppliers, you know, a bit of um, supplier hopping if they've been placed on stop elsewhere. So it's certainly something to, to keep in mind. I think there's, there'll, there'll definitely be hidden hidden um, debtors in there that, that would be doing that without a doubt. That's conceptually a tricky one because at, at a market level, when you see inquiries go up, it's normally a good thing. But on an individual business or, or consumer, it can actually mean the reverse in some situations. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what are the main drivers for lower defaults during COVID? Um, the, the big the big thing, and that was lower defaults, court actions, insolvencies, all the main all the main indicators of um, you know of credit risk. You know, dropped 30, 40, 50 percent. Um, there was a, a few sort of reasons for that. One was the government intervention with, you know, job keeper, job seeker, and um, protections around uh, safe harbour. Um, so naturally, there was, you know, there was more cash in in the economy, and we were living in that synthetic environment. People were paying their bills, but there was also a huge amount of support for for businesses. So creditors not necessarily registering defaults at that 30 or 60 day overdue point like they would normally. They were, you know, very very keen on nursing their their customers through that period, and, and and a very Aussie thing to do around mateship, I would I would suggest, and we've seen that um, as I mentioned through sort of Brisbane floods and other natural disasters in specific regions as well. That support um, and and changing the way that their collection rhythm um, occurs, and then the other thing is that the, the major banks and, and the ATO, which make up a huge number of the wind ups and insolvencies, they basically went to zero overnight. Um, you know, Team Australia kicked in all the way back in sort of March, April, 2020. If you can think back that far, and um, you know that they were they were responsible for essentially having having insolvency rates drop away. You know, probably 30 of that 40 percent. I, I would suggest. So, what what we're starting to see now, of course, is that the the banks start to get back into a normal collection rhythm, and, and we always predicted they would start before the ATO. But now we know that the ATOs, you know, made um, uh, made it quite clear that you know directors, for example, are going to be hit with um, uh, uh, tax default notices. And then, of course, what I'll talk about in a bit, they've started to register ATO tax defaults against companies that that owe um, the ATO significant amounts and are, and are a significant um, time overdue as well. So that will drive an increase in in defaults and, and insolvencies too. Um, can you explain why we need defaults for a healthy economy? Yes, there's a there's a saying that I keep stealing from um, from John Winters, and he stole it from someone as well. He's the CEO at Arita, and and it's along the lines of um, capitalism without insolvency is like Catholicism 
without hell. Um, you have to fear um, the downside of not paying your bills ultimately. If you don't have to pay your bills, then no one gets paid. So there has to be defaults, there have to be insolvencies, it's as simple as that. Um, and we know that there is a fairly consistent average over the last you know, three, four, five years, um, even if you take out sort of 08 um, and, and a few of the other, you know, major economic events that over the last sort of 20 years, um, you know, we, we typically see, I think it's about uh, six and a half to 7,000 insolvencies every year. Um, so, you know, in, in order to be in a normal collection credit rhythm, we need to see insolvencies. Otherwise, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's an unexplained phenomenon happening um, unless everyone decides to pay their bills, but that means no one's taking any, any credit risk. So there's, uh, there's, I won't, not an expert on what happens if we all reduce our, our exposure, but then you've, you have businesses that aren't getting access to funds where they need it. So um, Annika or James, did you want to add anything to, to that point? Oh, I'm a simple person, Pat. I think if there's no d defaults, no one would pay their bills. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, um, on that point, the US is a good market to look for as an example of, you know, they're not they're not quite at the extreme other end, but you know, part the GFC was partly called, caused by um, the old jingle mail, I think it was the term jingle mail, where people just put their keys in an envelope, sent it to the bank, and walked away from their debt, um, and it caused global havoc. So, um, yeah. People do need to pay their bills. If you haven't, haven't watched The Big Short, go and watch The Big Short. It explains it very, yeah. very well, very simple in very simple terms. Um, all right, so that's all, all the questions that have come through, which is good. On to the last slide, if you could for me, James. So this has been spoken about for a very, 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 very long time. We've been working, lobbying, working with the ATO um, for, I would say, oh, yeah, well over five years to get them to start lodging ATO tax defaults. Uh, and I'm not gonna say that it's only Creditor Watch. I think any, any creditor who has ever had a company, a customer go into a administration, um, more likely than not, it's been wound up either by the ATO or the, they owe the ATO you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and we would get customers ask us all the time, how can we find out if they've got a large debt with the ATO? You know, why can't we, why won't the ATO provide that information? You know, they're basically supporting good businesses, no, sorry, supporting bad businesses. And then those bad businesses rack up debts with, you know, other companies. And then all of a sudden it all falls over and, and everyone loses out. You know, they said, if we, if we knew that there was hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars owed, we wouldn't have offered them a credit account. So um, great news um, as of yesterday, I think it was about 4.15, um, our, uh, our, our our team lead developer, Ari, came over to me, very excited and let me know that we are now live with ATO tax default. So a huge shout out to Credit Watch development team for working um, so hard on it, but also liaising with the ATO who've been fantastic to work with as well. So essentially now what we have are um, ATO tax defaults. Um, the, the policy was known as disclosure of business tax debts. It was passed in late 2019 was supposed to go live in, in early 2020, but um, this thing called COVID-19 came along and disrupted that. And then it's finally um, happened two years later. So the, the essentials to understand are the ATO will register business tax debts under the following criteria where an, uh, an entity has an ABN. Um, the, the debt has to be um, more than $100,000 and that can be single or it can be, you know, multiple invoices, for example, with, with, the, with, the, with the tax office. Um, there has been no engagement with the ATO. So essentially they've buried their head in the sand and aren't engaging with the ATO. If, if the ATO has reached out by a, you know, a call or, or, a, or a letter and, and, and you've responded to them, that, that's, that in the ATO's mind is, is engagement. So, so you've, you've bought yourself more time. So this is, this is really 90 days overdue, over $100,000, haven't answered, haven't picked up the, the call from the ATO or anything like that. And, and there's no active complaint with the Inspector General of the uh, Taxation Ombudsman either. They then have their own policy in place leading up to obviously registering that default. So they give the company plenty of opportunities to engage with them, to pay their bills, to get into some sort of payment um, regime with them. And then at that point where, uh, where, where the, the time lapses, they, they lodge a tax default. And at, at present, Creditor Watch is the only uh, credit reporting bureau in Australia that has access to that information. 
Um, and the ones that I looked at yesterday, I went through about 10 of them while I, while I had the time. Um, there was probably two at about $200,000. The rest were sort of that five five $500,000 mark. And there was one or two that was sitting at a million dollars. Um, so just just huge numbers, right? You know, this this um, while while we haven't adjusted the uh, the credit rating just yet, and that'll be a phone call to to James straight after uh, uh, this webinar. Um, it certainly will have a, a large effect on the credit rating. We just want to make sure that you know we we use the data and and, and pop that into the complex credit risk models that we have in place. Um, but know that you know if you are if you are monitoring a customer and an ATO tax default is lodged against it, um, we will send you an email alert. If you look up a company and there is a tax default against that company, you will see it on the credit report and you can only get that with Credit Watch. So if you're missing out on that, if you're not using Credit Watch, I would suggest that you give us a call um, because we can talk you through that and you'll see um, how powerful that information is. It is the biggest game changer in, in the credit reporting um, industry uh, since probably court actions or maybe you know, live APIs were built um, with with uh, with ASIC, for example. So, just really important information to get your hands on. So, um, a big big congratulations to everyone that worked hard on that at Creditor Watch, and, and a big congratulations to the ATO as well. Um, they worked extremely hard to get that through, um, that, that get that legislation passed through government. It's it's not exactly a, a sexy piece of legislation that um, politicians want to want to be um, voting on. So, it took time; they had to get it right. And, and the, the priority for the ATO is obviously to get that information out into the public, but also um, a huge amount of you know, work going into to protecting businesses to make sure that no errors are made along the way. Um, let me just see a couple of questions coming through. I think I've answered most of them, which is good. Um, I do have a poll actually. I would have been in trouble if I had have forgotten about that because we do like to do polls and we sort of uh, forgot about it for a while. So given the climate of rising inflation, will you be reducing your purchasing as a business consumer or both? So we've got um, so a, a few options here. Yes, as a business, but not as a consumer. Yes, as a consumer, not as a business. Yes, yes to both. And no, I won't be reducing my purchasing. So always, um, always good to get a feel for, for how people um, and businesses, both as a consumer or a business, um, uh, planning to operate in the current environment and and also going forward. So got about 50% of you voted. Thank you. I'll give it another couple of seconds and then I'll uh, I'll turn it off and I'll I'll share some of the results and um, we will then wrap up uh, the webinar. All right. What have we got? All right. Hopefully everyone can see that. So the big ones there. 50% won't be reducing my purchasing, which for me, that's a win. That's that's what I take out as a win. And also, um, yes, as a consumer, but not as a business. So I think I think that probably lends to what we were talking about before, that businesses are, are ready to you know get on with it and, and get back into a, that normal, um, normal business process of uh, actually doing business and investing in the future. So that's a positive. Um, so thank you everyone. Um, what I will do is I will wrap up and then I'll show one last little poll which basically says let us know if, if you want someone from Credit Watch to be in contact with you. It's a nice way for us to, to target our, our follow-ups whether it's um, customer related or, or just information related on, on today's webinars. Um, Annika, great to have you for your first webinar with Credit Watch. Um, fantastic input so look forward to having you with us again and James as always mm -hmm. Thank you for the work on uh, on all the insights. So thanks very much to, to both of you for joining us today. Yeah. All right, everyone, I'll uh, I'll leave this up for a um, for a little bit, and then I will uh, close off the webinar for today. Thank you to everyone at home or in the office who joined us. Great to uh, great to have you with us, and um, look forward to having you at our next webinar. Plenty more coming up, whether it's business risk index. Um, ATO tax default related or just uh, you know general sort of product knowledge from the Creditor Watch team. So thank you everyone and we will see you very soon.